Hello, thank you for joining me for another brand deep dive brand history. Today we are talking all about CoverGirl. And wow, there is a lot of history on this brand. If you are new here, hello, my name is Stacy. I am in my mid 40s. I love all things beauty, fashion, skincare, and I do love to research things. I have started a series on my channel where I'm doing some deep dive into brands. I will leave that playlist down below, but I put these videos out every other Friday. CoverGirl, how did the brand start? If you have tried CoverGirl products, you may be familiar with the specific scent. And if that scent reminds you of Noxzema, there is a reason for that. We need to start with the Noxzema Chemical Company, headquartered in Baltimore. This was back in the 50s. Their staple product was Noxzema Cream, known for sunburns, to give the relief from sunburns. However, since it was for sunburn relief, you can imagine that it wasn't really purchased and repurchased all that much. There was a lady, Mary that worked at SSC and B advertising. And her suggestion was that they reposition the Noxzema cream as a face cream in beauty that women could use to wash their faces. And ta-da, in 1958, CoverGirl was born. Before we go more about CoverGirl, I just wanted to go over what I was wearing today. You have probably seen this in a couple of my videos if you're not new here. It is so comfortable that I've just been wearing it a lot. This is a flannel shirt. I got this from Timu. I will have that video where I did the haul listed up above and down below. This is just so comfortable. So if you haven't checked out Timu, you might want to. If you do, I do have a link down below and a code. If you are a new time user, you will get 30% off your order. So make it count in that cart. But all right, I just wanted to let you know this is so comfortable. Let's time travel back to 1958. They didn't set out to become a massive makeup company. That wasn't their goal. So they decided to start with two medicated products. So that is why there's that Noxzema smell in CoverGirl products or a lot of them. So they started with a liquid makeup and a compressed powder. Since they were medicated products, the company claimed that these were products that were good for your skin. They even went so far to say that it was better than not using makeup at all. And in 1961, those two products went national. They used magazine and TV ads heavily to market their products. Therefore, there is a lot of documentation, a lot of ad examples, so I will be putting those up throughout the video as I'm talking, and then probably at the end I'll do like a little slideshow because there was a lot that I could find, which was exciting. They targeted teenagers and young women, and also later in 1961 they added a loose powder to their line. What they did was the liquid makeup in the compressed powder, it came in three different shades and there was a different colored compact that represented which shade you were buying. White was for light, red for medium, and brown for dark. The dark shade they eventually ended up renaming as brunette. And in 1962, they launched a co-ed high school cover girl contest. Now co-ed is the name of the magazine that this contest was in. It began in 1962 and it ran for a lot of years, this contest that they would always publish in that magazine. The first winner was Nora at age 17. Prizes include posing for the magazine co-ed, a year supply of CoverGirl makeup, and a hundred dollars U.S. savings bond. So featuring high school girls, you know, really cultivated the youthful, wholesome image for the brand. Not only did they advertise in that co-ed magazine, they also advertised in Red Book, McCall's, Teen, Women's Day, Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, Glamour, Life, and Look magazine. And by 1962, they clearly knew that they had a hit on their hands because the sales volume that year reached over half of the all-time record for just the Noxzema skin cream. And we may think that, you know, Kim Kardashian 
in the Kardashian clan is what made contouring famous and started contouring. Or maybe it was the makeup artist that started the trend. Mm -mm. 1964, CoverGirl was already marketing to contour and highlight. I mean, how genius. They were already suggesting that women buy more than one shade in order to contour. So yeah, marketing genius right there, right? They said to use the lighter shades to accentuate or bring forward features that need emphasized. Circles or lines under the eyes. They said to apply a lighter color of your foundation and then put your regular foundation over it. Face too round or too square. Use a darker color of base or powder on your jawline from your ears to your chin. Nose too long, apply a darker shade to the tip. I personally thought that was really interesting that they were marketing it that way. Then we move on to 1964, and this is when they added lipsticks. They had eight shades initially to the line, real red, clear crimson, pure scarlet, true rose, natural peach, pink beige, pastel pink, and natural frost. And once again, they marketed to buy a couple different shades and mix and match your lipstick to get that perfect shade unique to you. They suggested, you know, buying one lipstick and using that color to line your lips. Buy the other lipstick and use that one to fill your lips. Also in 1964, they had their first foreign branch in Britain. However, it was not up and running yet in this year, but that's when it was first started. 1966, we saw some more lipstick shades added, and this time it was the frosty trend. We had beige caper, pink whim, bare minimum, and orange fling. And they also added two lip toners, gloss gloss, and bold gold. And I was surprised to see the boss because I feel like nowadays, you know, everything's like girl boss and boss babe and stuff. So I just thought that that was interesting too. There was so many interesting little things as I was researching this. I was like, ooh, look at cover girl go. And also in 1966, the company decided to rename instead of Naxima Chemical Company, it was now named to Naxel Corporation, which I feel like that makes sense because yeah, I don't know if I'd really want to be buying makeup from something that had chemical in their brand name. I don't know. What about you? Also in this year, they decided to move some of the manufacturing in-house. Prior to this, the products in the packaging was all being made by private label firms. They opened a new plant in Cockeysville, Baltimore County, Maryland. In 1967, we saw more lipstick shades being added, and this time they were called flashers. The colors included natural flash, amber flash, pink flash, and lightning flash. That makes me think of Reese. <laughs> and a brush on blusher was introduced in three shades. It was called glow lightly. And I do have their blusher. I will say I can see that glow lightly still I think describes it today because the blusher that I have at least from them it is a very like minimal blush look you do have to kind of build it up talking about the products that will be there's way too much history to go into the history and the products in one video so that will be coming up where I'm going to compare the products that have been in their line you know the OG products that have been in their line for years and then their newer products we're going to do a little comparison so if you're not already of course i just have to plug make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that video old versus new in 1968 they shifted gears instead of marketing it as a medicated makeup they shifted gears to call it clean makeup which again, isn't it so interesting? It just seems like they were really ahead of their time with the different trends. They also launched an acne remedy blush in three shades that year. In 1969, they revamped some of their packaging and they called this new packaging Pilfer Proof Packaging. Their products were number one and two of the best-selling makeup products in the US. So I guess they were having some theft issues, I would guess with that new name of pilfer proof packaging. And again, we had more lipsticks in Pearlies this time that was in four shades. So they were definitely churning out those lipsticks. In 1970 is when we got some new face 
products. This is, they, introdu they introduced a range of CoverGirl Super Sheer Cosmetics, said to provide a natural look. It started with three products, CoverGirl Super Sheer Liquid, a foundation in Sheer Bear, Sheer Buff, and a Sheer Blush. That is a mouthful, tongue twister to say fast. They launched the CoverGirl Translucent Powder, a pressed powder in Sheer Nude, and sheer natural shades. Also a translucent blusher duo was launched. It was a double pan blusher in sheer peach and peach glow is in one and then the other one was sheer pink and pink glow. And I just found that this was interesting. How many times can I say that? Okay I thought a lot of things were interesting. I think that's already been established but I was able to find their annual reports. From 1970 their net income was $4,055,000. And remember, that was in 1970. Now that was for the CoverGirl products and the Noxzema cream combined, just, you know, to keep that in mind. But And in the uh, annual report, you can see on that last page, it shows the directors, and yes, it was definitely an old, the old boys club. In 1971 is when they launched into eye product. They introduced a line of 47 products that included mascaras, eyeshadow, and eyebrow pencils. And again, this shows that they were ahead of their time because in 1972, the FDA had restricted the use of this ingredient. <laughs> but Nuxel Corporation, they didn't have to like freak out and, sh you know, shift gears and stuff because the year before they had already taken out that ingredient in their products. They still had other, what was called bactericides that, so they could still consider them and market them as cosmetic, as makeup that was medicated. Also in 1972, we had some more product launches. There was the Gloss and Gleam a compact blusher and lip gloss. We had a super gloss for the lips, shiny shadow and cream eyeshadow in pots. In 1973, they launched Peeper Sticks eyeshadow crayons. And also in this year, they realized that their initial target market, the teenage girls, they were growing. So they began to introduce products that were geared towards women over the age of 25. Starting with the CoverGirl Moisture Makeup and CoverGirl Moisturizing Cover Stick. It was also this year that they reached an agreement to market CoverGirl and Noxzema both in Japan. In 1974, again, more product launches. We have the Long and Lush Mascara, Soft Line Eyeliner, Eyeshadow, a Moisturizing Big Eyeshadow. In 1975, we had a nine hour eye polish, a liquid shadow, and a liner in one, and the girl shiny lipsticks. It was also in 1975 that they reached an agreement to start selling their products in West Germany. So they were just getting all over the place. In 1976, they introduced the one stroke eye color, moisture cream makeup, moisture cream blush, moisture encapsulated pressed powder. That was what was the start of the Moisture Wear makeup range. Now in 1977 is when they decided to get into nail polish with the launch of Nail Slicks. And that earlier that I mentioned that Britain office that they had opened but wasn't up and running, by 1977 it was up and running and now they were distributing in nine European countries. And as you can see, they did not stop with the product launches. In 1978, they launched Professor Professional Mascara, Color Maddox Eyeshadow, a 9-hour cheek color, liquid blush, all-day oil control liquid makeup in five shades, and later they launched an oil control translucent powder. And in 1981, they launched an oil control powder blush in five shades. So in 1981, now the company had three different lines based on your skin type. They had regular, oil control for the oily skins, and the moisture wear for dry skins. And by 1984, they increased their advertising again. So there was a study that said that 97% of women at that time were seeing a CoverGirl 
message on average once a week. That's a lot. So they were just all over the board. TV, magazines, newspapers. And in 1985, it was also stated that one in every two consumers were purchasing a CoverGirl powder, either the oil control or the moisture wear powder. And in the 80s, CoverGirl, they were the leading mass market cosmetic line in the U.S. Around that time, we also had Maybelline, but again, CoverGirl was still outperforming them. Maybe Maybelline will be added to the list. Let me know, FYI, anytime that you think of a company that you want to learn more about, always just leave me a comment. It can be on any video. Um, the next ones are going to be Too Faced and Revlon and Laura Geller. Those are the next three that are up. But if you have suggestions, please leave them in the comments. But back to CoverGirl. Both companies, Maybelline and CoverGirl, were really heavily advertising. And it's reported that the Noxell Corporation was using 20% of their sales earnings on advertising. So in 1988, we had some changing of the guards. The Procter & Gamble acquired Noxell Corporation, and it was actually in a stock swap deal that was valued at $1.3 billion, billion with a B, dollars. And according to the cosmetic and skin, that Procter & Gamble, the reason that they were interested in it was simply because they did not have a makeup line in their portfolio, and they wanted one. And by 1980, 88 in that annual report, their net earnings was now $51 million. And let's see, what category have they not been in yet that they maybe should be? Well, 